and friends of Conti. So we're delighted to have everybody here to celebrate this place and this man for his conservation leadership. Um, this is a project right here that's 32 acres that Kestrel helped protect in partnership with Trust for Public Land and the Silvio Conti Wildlife Refuge. Um, it was slated to be four house lots. So mm -hmm. these signs that say land conserved did say for sale earlier this year in July. And there's nothing like a for sale sign to motivate people. Um, and four of them really motivates people. Uh, we, uh, this was an absolute no brainer for us because when you looked at our brochure from last year, this was the picture that is the, the the flagship for what Kestrel is all about, uh, which is conserving the heart of the valley, conserving the valley that everyone loves, um, the grassland bird habitat here, the farmland, the rivers, the forests, and the Mount Holyoke Range, which is behind us. Um, and this place, I think, brings it all together. And I know so many people who travel this road either as a cutoff, uh, a shortcut, but also as for walking, for birding, and Everyone loves it. I don't know anyone who doesn't love this place. And the fact that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and through the Land and Water Conservation Fund and the federal government has invested so much in purchasing this land and creating a new space for public use is, I think, a wonderful thing. Um, and I think hope Andy French will talk to us about some of the trails and, and ideas he has for making it accessible to, to people. Um, if you can believe it, this was actually a project that we almost didn't celebrate <laughs> because we had a very busy year and, you know, as we do deals, we just kind of go on to the next one. Um, but Congressman Olver called me up in July and he was on recess from Congress and had just come back from a, a birding outing on this road. And he said, did you know about that land out there? <laughs> There's so many bobolinks. Now that land has to be protected. And in fact, we were just in the process of finishing the project. And uh, it was his, his prompting that uh, we decided together to celebrate it and not let it go unnoticed. Um, so for that, we're grateful as well. And, um, and for all of the hard work that Congressman Olver did to make this project happen and many of the others that we'll talk about um, in a few minutes. So um, before I move on, I just wanted to start us off with a poem about bobolinks. Because the <laughs> bobolinks are what drew Congressman Olver to this place. And um, this is a little bit different project than we do in Hadley. Normally it's uh, farmland. And uh, th you know, this, this is, does provide hay, but it also provides grassland bird habitat and will be managed for that. And the bobolinks are the ones that benefit. Um, so this is a poem by Emily Dickinson, and it's called The Way to Know the Bobolink. The way to know the bobolink from every other bird, precisely as the joy of him, obliged to be inferred. Extrinsic to attention, too intimate with joy, he complements existence until allured away. By seasons or children, adult and urgent grown, or unforeseen aggrandizement, or happily renowned. By contrast certifying the bird of birds is gone, how nullified the meadow, her sorcerer withdrawn. <laughs> so here we are in fall, the bobolinks have gone to South America, is that right? We'll learn Argentina. a little bit more about that. Um, so our first uh, person who is here today to speak is Paige Coles from Trust for Public Land. She has been the chair since uh, for two years, is that right? And on the board from, of the National Trust for Public Land since 2010 and has comes to this work 
with the history and conservation finance, which is really what our Kestrel's partnership with Trust for Public Land is all about, is this incredible purchase, purchasing power that TPL brings to the Valley to make urgent projects happen. So thank you for thank coming. You. Thank you very much all. I'm delighted to be here and I would like to cite first my local connection. Uh, my husband's cousin, Margaret Jonas, is married to Robert Jonas, who is currently the chair of the Kestrel Land Trust. So. I wanted to be here for this occasion, but I also wanted to visit my relatives, so <laughs> it's a twofer. Uh, the Trust for Public Land is really quite delighted to participate in this celebration. We're proud to have established the Fort Road River Division of the Conti Refuge and to have led four acquisitions here since 2005. We're thrilled to have a, um, such an active and energetic partnership with the Kestrel Land Trust which exemplifies the ways in which we as a national organization seek to work uh, with those who really know their communities best. And we're happy to have supported the Conti Refuge throughout the Connecticut River uh, watershed for many years through leadership within the four state Friends of Conti Coalition, advocacy for the watershed as a priority landscape on the national stage and also through other activities of our Connecticut River program and our federal affairs work in Washington, D.C. But now I want to focus my remarks on the tremendous contributions that Representative Olver has made to land conservation all across the country. I'm, I'm fortunate uh, to have perspective on his work that extends beyond this beautiful spot, his district, or even the four state Connecticut River watershed. As Kristen said, my um, position as current chair of the National Board of the Trust for Public Land and as past chair of the Conservation Campaign, which is our conservation finance lobbying affiliate, I know that without funding, land conservation tends to be limited to those parcels owned by conservation-minded people who have the desire and the ability to donate their land or the development rights to their land. But not everyone has uh, the ability to make that choice. So we need public funding to compensate landowners who are willing to sell their uh, property for permanent conservation. In Representative Olver's case, as a member of the House Committee on Appropriations since 1991, and a member of the Interior and Related Agencies Subcommittee for many of those years, he has voted and fought for adequate funding for land conservation. This funding, as many of you know, comes from uh, the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which was established by Congress in 1965. It uses revenues from the depletion of one natural resource, offshore oil and gas, support the conservation of another priest's precious resource, our land and water. Every year what could be happening is that up to $900 million in royalties should be paid into the fund by the energy companies that are drilling on the Outer Continental Shelf. The money would go to such agencies as the National Park Service and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Unfortunately, however, much of the $900 million has often been diverted from these intended purposes to a lot of other uses. And without the efforts of people like Representative Olver, it's likely that even more of these land and water conservation fund monies would have been added to or would have been just a tiny drop in the general fund bucket rather than protecting important habitat and recreational areas such as this one. In my role as the National Board Chair, I have visited many projects that the Trust for Public Land has completed in partnership with federal agency around, agencies around this nation using land and water conservation funding. And these are, these are all pretty iconic places that you'll recognize, but the uh, Golden Gate National Recreation Area in California, Zion National Park in Utah, Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado, and the Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area uh, in Georgia, just to name just really just a few. I learned for uh, some remarks I was making last week to a 
National Park Friends Alliance group mm -hmm. that the Trust for Public Land over the last 40 years, the Kestrel Trust has been in business for 42 years, we've been in business for 40 years, we've helped protect 200 places that have either have protected in holdings in national parks or have created entirely new national parks. So we're, we're active, let me put it that way, with this federal funding source. But protecting these places is economically important too. The Trust for Public Land estimated that over a 10 year period from 98 to 2009, every one dollar invested in land conservation returned four dollars in economic value over that period. According to the Outdoor Industry Association, active outdoor recreation supports more than six and a half million jobs and contributes more than $730 billion annually to our national economy. So, you know, it's an engine, what we've got, what we work on. Representative Oliver has demonstrated over the past two decades that he understands the value of these public investments. His work here in District 1 and in Washington, D.C. has secured funding for the Conti Refuge here in Hadley, uh, for forest legacy easements, such as the one the Kestrel Land Trust recently contributed or completed on Brushy Mountain in Leverett, and for many other worthy conservation projects in this really beautiful valley. It's also ensured protection of land in such far-flung places as Alaska, Montana, and Florida, so that if you travel pretty much anywhere in this great nation, you'll be likely within shouting distance of a place you can visit and enjoy, thanks in significant part to a man many of you know personally. It is not an understatement to say that no other member of the House of Representatives has been a greater friend to conservation over the last two decades than Representative Olver, and I feel honored to express the Trust for Public's Land's appreciation for your work. Thank you. It's a great reminder to, to remember how important local places are on a national scale. You know, to compare Hadley to Montana. Not everybody does that, <laughs> and it sometimes takes the outside perspective. And also, uh, for John Olver, you know, he's such a local hero. But to know that you're a national hero also is is a good reminder. Um, so our next next speaker is Andy French, who is the manager of the Conti Refuge, and is responsible for a lot of what you see here. Only the good stuff. <laughs> you know, when you were talking about uh, this this area, I was thinking about uh, earlier this spring when I got out of the vehicle just down the road, and um, I heard birds everywhere. They were just it was just a racket. I couldn't see any of them. They were all down in the they were all down in the grass. But it was just it was it was very very noisy, and uh, but it was also very rewarding. I want to thank you guys for coming out this afternoon um, and participating in this event and uh, all the things that have led up to this event. Uh, I've often said to my partners, but also to people in the Fish and Wildlife Service, my idea of a, of a great day is um, uh, when I come in in the morning and I get a message from Tom Gazer, who's hmm. sitting back over there in the corner. Uh, he handles all the uh, real estate transactions for the Silvio Conti Refuge, working with with. 20 different partners in the watershed, but I get an email message some, from him and it says, it says, we closed. And so one of the first things I say to him, I send him a message, I say, can you update the, uh, can you update the uh, uh, ownership by state list? And, and uh, he updates that and I look at the new total down on the bottom and I send out an email message to the friends of the Silvio Conti Refuge and my staff and the title is, we grew. And, uh, <laughs> You know, it, it it's 32 acres here, but it you know it all you know it all adds up. Um, on October 3rd this year, uh, the Silvio Conti Refuge turns 15, and um, and and in 15 years, uh, the Silvio Conti Refuge it was established in uh, 1997 when we accepted a donation from the 
uh, the, the Connecticut River Watershed Council. It was the 3.8 acre Third Island in Deerfield, Massachusetts. And since that, and since that time, it's grown to almost 36,000 acres. It's actually the third largest refuge in our 13 state northeast region. And um, you know, it's it's also the most most spread out. It's the most it's the most diverse. Uh, on the same day in the spring, we can be shoveling snow in the northern part of the refuge and mowing the lawn in the southern. <laughs> anyway, so 36,000 acre refuge over a 15-year period, we've grown by about 2,400 acres a year. Some some years it's a few hundred acre, acres, and in other years it might be you know 20,000 acres. But the important thing, and uh, it's it's this Fort River Division that really changed my thinking on, on conservation and uh, transitioned me into thinking more about landscape conservation. Um, when, when, I, when I look at the 36,000 acres, uh, we're part of almost a two million acre conservation mosaic that is truly a multi-state partnership approach in the Connecticut River watershed. Connecticut River watershed is a 7.2 million acre watershed it's got 396 communities and about 2.4 million people. Uh, Two million acres has been invested in conservation, and, and part of that is has occurred, you know, occurred right here. It's it's pretty significant. All this success, uh, all this success is is due to, it, it's due to the support from the the delegations, and it's due to the success of of our partners, and uh, like. The remarks preceding me, uh, I especially want to thank Congressman Olver. Um, uh, over the, I've been the project leader of the Silvio Conti Refuge for a decade now. Thoroughly enjoyed it, and I have to say, um, I I get, I, I get these phone calls from the congressman, uh, not not of recent, but uh, the <laughs> first, uh, for probably the first five years I'd be here, I'd get a I get a call from the congressman and and there's no mistaking his voice. <laughs> and I'd say hello and he'd say, he'd say, Andrew French? <laughs> and it, right, right away I knew what, this is John Oliver. And I said, I know who this is. <laughs> and you know, and he'd ask me, you know, he'd ask me questions and, and one of the things that, he knew his district. And I mean, he knew this area and one of the things I knew is I have my A game when I started talking about specifics of projects. I remember, I still remember uh, a, 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 an afternoon or an evening we were at Judy's house and we were sitting down talking about some land conservation deals and the congressman was there and he's pointing to the map and he's, you know, they're polygons to me, you know, track maps. And he was pointing to different ownerships. There's no names on there. And he was saying <laughs> who was who, I mean, he knew, you know, he knew the community and, and he knew what was going on from a conservation perspective and that really impressed me. Um, I mentioned a, a, a minute ago uh, the Fort River Division, you know, it really, it, it, it really, and the partnership behind it, the, the folks that were working here long before uh, I ever entered into the picture as the refuge manager, and prior to that, the, the, the chief of our division of real estate. Um, you know, we were looking at this patchwork, this, this conservation mosaic, and I, you know, what I realized, you know, when you look at the Connecticut River watershed, two things happen. As you go, as you descend in latitude and descend in elevation, the size of the ownership gets smaller and the cost of land gets bigger. And, um, and in here, uh, I refer to it as the Fort River approach. We're coming in, what we're trying to do with the land acquisition authority and the funding that we have is we're trying to facilitate connectivity in area, elevation, latitude, aspect, you know, exposure and process. And we're trying to plug into that conservation mosaic in, in a strategic manner that adds value to the whole. Rather than coming in and saying, okay, we're gonna buy right here. I, I early on referred to it as a, the Fort River approach and it's, and it's something that uh, I have you could say exported elsewhere in, in the watershed. Again, this is a wonderful location, especially when you think about all the things that are going on around us. You know, this has been set aside in perpetuity for wildlife and people. And it'll, it'll be a, a special place, close to a lot of other places we can come down and enjoy. 
one of the things that uh, we're hoping to uh, get started on, maybe yet this fall, but definitely next spring, uh, putting in a uh, at least a 1.2 mile long uh, wheelchair accessible interpretive nature trail right over here on the other property, and um, it'll have you know it'll have elevated walkways, overlooks, and as I said, it'll be wheelchair accessible. I think it'll be a pretty popular uh, site for, you know, not only uh, uh, schools and public, but families. And so it, it, it should be a, it should be a, a, a attractive destination. Anyway, in closing, thank you for, thank you for uh, coming out this afternoon. Thank you for all that you're doing. Uh, for wildlife and people here in the watershed, and I especially, again, Congressman Oliver, I want to say thank you. Uh, I've really enjoyed, I've really enjoyed working uh, for you uh, over the last ten years, and I've especially enjoyed working with your staff. Your staff has been wonderful as well. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, and now it. I'd like to introduce Patrick Cummins, who's of Friends of Conti Refuge and National Audubon. Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm thrilled to be here today. Um, um, Congressman Olver may not be the only person who calls up Andy and bugs him about Fort River. Uh, <laughs> for many years, I've been saying, what's going on with Fort River? Uh, you're going to get those acquisitions done. Why is that? I'm director of bird conservation for Audubon, Connecticut. And I, uh, this started even before I was chairman of the uh, Friends of Conti. Why does the director of bird conservation for Connecticut care about a piece of property here in Massachusetts? It's because of the grassland birds. You'd mentioned the bobolinks earlier, but there's other birds of concern out here. Last time I was here, there was a northern harrier flying around here, a type of hawk. I also had an eastern meadowlark flying around. All of these grassland birds are regionally endangered. Um, the entire suite of grassland specialists in New England are on one state list or another, either as endangered, threatened, or a special concern. This site here, the Fort River area, can prove to be a grassland bird factory. That is, a site that can be a source population for grassland birds. So as our partners in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Connecticut work to restore their populations of grassland birds, there'll be a reservoir of excess birds that can be produced by areas like this that can then go and colonize the new sites that we protect and restore in the other states. So I'm so thrilled that this parcel is protected. And there's still a lot of work here. This, this area around Fort River has the potential to provide thousands of acres of grassland and bird habitat. And uh, I'll continue bugging Andy uh, until, until we're, we have the job done here. Not only does it, is it important for these grassland birds, it's also an important migratory stopover habitat. I had the, I've had the occasion to be here late in, the, late in the day this time of year, and it's just amazing the amount of migrant birds that are moving through here. These riparian areas have been documented as a nationally significant flyway for birds along the Atlantic Flyway through a study from the Silvio Conti National Fish and Wildlife Refuge. So it's all part of this matrix. The birds that we like to see here in Connecticut depend, I mean, uh, down in Connecticut, depend on the habitats that this property provides right here in central Massachusetts. And it's a key victory for the entire Connecticut River watershed national blue way, the only one in the country. We talked about Montana earlier. Montana does not have a national blue way, <laughs> but New England does. So the Friends of Conti is an association of over 40 organizations, close to 50 organizations, um, conservation organizations, uh, outdoor recreation organizations, and environmental education organizations that all work to further the common goals that we have with the Conti, Re the Conti uh, Refuge and the Connecticut River watershed. So, well, you folks here, Tr Clems worked very hard on this project from Trust for Public Land, and uh, the Kestrel Land Trust, Kestrel Trust, are working to protect on the ground conservation results here um, at the Fort River Division. But know that you have close to 50 organizations working to and have your back from the far reaches of northern part of the watershed in Vermont, New Hampshire, all the way down to the mouth of the Connecticut River in, in, in Connecticut and beyond in New York City and in um, in Washington, D.C., who are working hard behind the scenes to, to make sure that this happens. So um, keep up the great work. And, thank, and the Connecticut River watershed and the Conti Refuge have a lot of champions, but our best champion is right here. And thank you for all of the support for land and water conservation in general over the years and for the Conti, uh, Conti Refuge.
Thank you so much. We're all connected, north, south, east, west. Uh, before we move on to giving an award to Congressman Olver, I wanted to invite representatives from Hadley, local representatives, if they wanted to say any words, you're welcome to now. I just want to correct one thing you said first about this, oh. this, about this being a shortcut. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to drive by. It, it truly is not a shortcut. Uh -huh. You know, I, I love the washboard road to make sure that it's not a shortcut, but, but, but you're absolutely right. If you drive through here, it is not a shortcut. You're actually just taking more time to appreciate to appreciate the, the grassland versus birds, and, and I love doing this. And I, I think there's two other things. One is, for Congressman Olvery, this is a long overdue recognition. And it's more than just what you've done as our congressman, but the personal commitment that you and Rose have done for conservation to us here in the Valley you know, is a legacy that, that will not be replicated by anyone else. And my final comment is, there's only one person missing today, and that's Alexandra. Mm. But, but she was responsible for the fact that it didn't rain today. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for what you've done, Congressman. All right. Well, I'd like to invite Judy Eisman up to say a few words about her friend and colleague, and uh, John Olver. I, I uh, certainly owe a lot of debt to Judy for introducing me to the conservation community. and. Uh, Twelve years ago, I remember being at Judy's house, and we had an event for Kestrel, and and you came, uh, uh, Congressman, and, and it just it was a moment in time where I really realized what a special place it is to live in a valley where uh, the representatives in, in, uh, on a national stage still care about the local place. So I think Judy can speak to that. <coughs> I have a few notes, but I just, you know, this is a wonderful occasion, and I think it could have been seen as, as potentially an end, but I prefer to see it as a continuance, um, a new phase in your career, and <laughs> we intend to um, keep your influence and your, your hand in the, the business of conservation. Um, my husband and I moved to this area in 1969, which I think was the same year you joined the House of Representatives in the state. And um, I was a young faculty wife, and a few years later, um, one of my very early political lessons uh, came from John. Well, I guess it was about 30 years ago, before I really got deeply involved in either politics or in uh, environmental issues. He was running for re-election now for the state senate. And he came to breakfast at my home with a bunch of uh, UMass educators. And he told a story that stuck with me um, and still motivates me and when he said with some amazement that he'd received 12 letters on an issue. And that changed his outlook and his vote. And I've heard the story retold over the years. And the number of letters has increase proportionately <laughs> you know, as to how many it really takes now, I guess, to, to uh, convince and to, to get attention. But the point was clear then. Um, you needed to get involved, you needed to make your case, and you shouldn't give up. Someone will hear it and someone will help. And for many, many years, John Over has been a reliable someone in government who hears, thinks it all through, understands it, understands the complexities, and then helps. Time passed, and John left the State House for Congress and took his passion of the, for the out of doors with him, the hiking and the biking and the rock climbing and the studying of maps that others have mentioned, looking for potential, potential connections. Um, staff at Kestrel has grown accustomed to having him pop in and uh, look at the maps and check on alternate routes for the National Scenic Trail. If you want to see his broadest smiles, his staff says, take him to the mountaintop. <laughs> then he's, he stands up there and he points out the towns and the farms and the water courses and the trails that make our valley the very vibrant and special place that it is. But as you recall from some of his campaign literature, uh, he's a workhorse, not a show horse. And we expect to have him working with us for the environment and for land protection for a long time to come. So, on behalf of the Kestrel Land Trust, 
the Trust for Public Land, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for your countless efforts and your unfailing conservation leadership. We want to present you with a painting by Christine Labitt, which commemorates the Champagne Parcel here on the Moody Bridge Road, and a certificate, <laughs> apparently. I didn't realize there was a certificate. Um, this is an iconic landscape, as you can all tell, for, <laughs> for not just for artists, but for everyone who recognizes nature's beauty and its bounty and its fragility in the face of human needs and desires. We hope you and Rose enjoy this painting and that it will serve as a reminder of the friends and partners who are working to preserve what many of us see as the heart of the valley. And you have been, and we are confident we can rope you in for a few more years <laughs> to keep you a vital member of the team. The certificate reads, presented to Congressman John Oliver for two decades of service to the Connecticut River Valley. I think it's more, actually. And for your under outstanding leadership to, cons to conserve land within the Silvio County National Fish and Wildlife Refuge. Thank you for the honor and the gift. The, uh, this will this will hang uh, in a place of honor in our home if we can find places for it. <laughs> <laughs> the things nowadays, I'm finding that I have to close down some offices, and I have so many different things that I I have piles of boxes full of of, uh, of the things that have been given over the years, and I don't know whether they're all going to go into some sort of an archival thing or not, but this will hang as a place, in a place of honor in the, in the home. So I want to thank, um, I want to thank Paige and, uh, and Kristen and Andy and, pa and, and Patrick, I only met you, this is today, Yes. this is the first time that we have met from the uh, Friends of the County Refuge uh, for your for your very kind words. Uh, we have really very much to celebrate today. Uh, the, uh, the, start, I'll, I'll start with the congratulations to the Fish and Wildlife Service on the 15th anniversary of the first acquisition. Andy's given a lot of uh, statistics, and you know I'm used to giving you statistics, so I'm going to have to take slightly different ways of, of reaching to those statistics, but uh, uh, talking about those statistics. Uh, uh, the first acquisition was, in fact, uh, in 1997, as he has said. It was Third Island in Deerfield. I happened to be present for that, I was lucky enough to be present for that uh, acquisition, and uh, the uh, it was a gift, a donation from the Connecticut Watershed Council, and um, and now today the refuge protects over 35,000 acres across four states. The legislation that created the uh, County Fish and Wildlife Refuge, which is a unique wildlife refuge. It was the first one that covered a whole watershed, and quite a large watershed. You know, the Connecticut River with this watershed covering four, four states, and he's told you how many total, seven million acres was it? In, million acres. in the, uh, in, the uh, in the total area. That's quite a, a broad area. Never before had there been a Fish and Wildlife Refuge that was created that covered that much, uh, that much, and covering the whole of the watershed. And this refuge was created and, and, uh, and named in honor 
of uh, both the creation and the uh, and the naming, in honor of my predecessor, as Congressman Silvio Conti, uh, for which it's uh, for which the refuge is named. It was passed as legislation in 1991, in December of 1991. Um, that was about ten, ten months after Silvio Conti had, had passed away suddenly. Uh, I had been elected to replace him in June of 1991, and, uh, and this legislation was being drafted by that time. So it was one of the earliest uh, pieces of legislation that I got a chance to, to vote on as a member of Congress uh, along the way. But it is. Uh, entirely justified because Silvio Conti was uh, an even better, an even better conserver of lands. His, he was a real conservationist as well, and a, uh, uh, he used it in a different way than I do, I guess. He was a great hunter and a great fisherman, so forth, and went on many expeditions of that sort. There are many stories about Silvio Conti. Some of them must be apocryphal because you can't really believe them. <laughs> I'm very bad at telling stories, so I won't even bother. But uh, the legislation was passed in 1990, uh, 1991. And um, it was first funded for the beginning of the procedures of, of the management of this refuge and what was to be done in the fiscal 1993 budget was because it was passed, the legislature was passed after the fiscal 92 budget had already been uh, completed. And so it took them, it took them several years, uh, uh, three, four years, I guess probably it was uh, at least, to do the planning, to look at what this resource was, because the question had to be asked, had to be answered, what was one going to do with, you couldn't do all of it, obviously, there's uh, several million people who live within this this refuge, and, and so the process has been to find what are the most critical habitats and to try to protect those, uh, those habitats. Their, their really first uh, banner year, uh, 35,000 acres, of that 35,000 acres, over 26,000 acres were added in 1999, that, their banner year. in. And uh, I think I think all of the uh, quit acquisitions in that banner year were in, within the state of Vermont. Twenty-six thousand of it in the in the Northeast Kingdom, if you know that territory up there beyond St. Johnsbury, and uh, east of Stowe Mountain. You know, I knew Stowe Mountain a little bit from uh, from skiing back in those in those days. Uh, it is it had very large properties. As Andy said, the properties were larger and they were less expensive. That one only cost, that 26,000 acres only cost about seven million dollars to, to make the acquisition. There was another acquisition in southern Vermont uh, at Putney Mountain at about the same time, a sizable one, uh, and that uh, the, the, the group that has been done in the Northeast Kingdom and the sizable ones in, in Vermont I think are the only ones that the are the, which are the, uh, the acquisitions directly through the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Uh, there are other things that have been bought with uh, Forest Legacy money. You, Paige, has, uh, has t taken you through the two key places in which monies are available and have been available over the years for, for these kinds of things to be done. So, uh, um, uh, I, over the intervening years since 1999, I have been very, uh, very pleased to add another seven million or so through earmarks at various times. Some of it uh, uh, was used in Massachusetts, and some of it has been used in other places. The earmarks were often not just specified to go to any particular uh, a pro pro project in the early days. They would be whatever was the thing that was. Uh, on the highest on the uh, agenda for the for the staff of the, uh, of the refuge, and so uh, uh, I'm happy to do that, and happy also that we were able to provide additional money beyond those kinds of things, those earmarks, to do with the forest legacy projects that have been done all over uh, in various parts of the 
ending with Russia Mountain, the, the, the big one uh, relatively recently. Andy's comments about the, I, I, I am responding to Andy's comments because uh, uh, I, uh, I had a, exactly the same reaction coming through here early in the morning in, uh, in June or thereabouts, uh, and, and the racket, the racket, <laughs> as he used the word, the racket, from the, the birds that were uh, in the grass. You didn't see much of them, a few of them here and there, but uh, if something disturbed them, there would be a, uh, an explosion, almost, of, uh, of, of birds out of the, out of the grass. And uh, uh, so Andy, Andy has uh, triggered that. Uh, so that leaves me, uh, that leads me with congratulating all of the partners of the uh, uh, the TPL page and Clem for his work uh, and the Kestrel Trust, uh, Tristan and uh, and Judy. Uh, on this 32-acre acquisition, because of your efforts in this area, in the Fort River uh, uh, unit, you have now 250 acres. This one is an important addition uh, to it. And uh, much can be done when federal and state government work collaboratively with lo lo uh, local and national uh, land trusts. In, that are devoted to uh, land conservation. The Kestrel, uh, Kestrel and TPL and, and uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service have proven that time and time again. Together they've protected these iconic view sheds like this one and the sensitive habitats that, uh, for species that live here. You now know that I have a particular <laughs> fondness for bobolinks. <laughs> That really comes because I was uh, born on a dairy farm and we grew hay. And if you were really uh, working on the dairy farm, you cut the hay whether the birds were there or not. And, uh, and I saw uh, many nests that were destroyed because of, of that. And, uh, and so, and, and furthermore, uh, uh, the you don't see the birds now. They are, as we speak, essentially, they are arriving on the pampas of Argentina, which if you think about it, is exactly the kind of habitat in their southern hemisphere that we have in May and June, uh, late April, May and June. And so they're down there, uh, but, but they will be back next spring. They will be back because this habitat will be maintained so others may experience the beauty. When there are dozens of breeding pairs of bobolinks and of uh, red-winged blackbirds and the others that, uh, that Patrick has mentioned, the ones that uh, also use this kind of habitat. And uh, if you come next, to, next June, you can see them on those early mornings when there's mist in the, in, over the meadow here, when the grass is high, I was surprised when they drove in, because I hadn't been through here in a, a month or so, and just to see that it had been cut and, the, and is now green with the rain that we have had. But I know that also from my days as a, a child growing up on a farm, that that is the way that uh, we as farmers had to use the uh, land. But I will enjoy it as they come back. Come January, uh, Jim McGovern, because this is this is uh, sort of the end of my political career. Uh, uh, it come January, Jim McGovern will represent this area, and uh, it, Jim has a particular interest in agriculture, a particular very strong interest in nutrition and uh, and uh, 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 and hunger on not only a national scale, but on an international scale. I think you uh, will be well represented by Jim McGovern as your congressman, 
and uh, and I certainly want to thank uh, Reggie Neal, my my other colleague in the area, who will take over some of the western part of my district at that time, and uh, and he has represented Hadley and has represented Hadley well in the meantime. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, all of you, for being here. Thanks for all the effort that you put in on, on land conservation. And uh, thanks for the role that you're playing in making the Conti refuge as the exceptional resource that it is today. to do with hosting you today. You can thank Kristen and her colleagues for, for everything. I want to just say a really brief word. John Over will not remember me, but about 12 years ago, I sat next to him for five minutes at our old high school. And at that time, we were working on um, the two little reservoirs we have up in the woods um, by Atkins, kind of, and we didn't know each other. But I said, hey, Mr. Over, you, you, you pay attention to watershed. You know, what do you think we should do with those two, um, those two reservoirs? You know, it's beautiful and it's important water. And he said, why don't you sell them to Amherst? <laughs> and looking back, I think that was like the political dope slap. Like, Hadley, Hadley can't get out of its own way in so many places. What are you talking to me about trying to help with these? Um, so my little word is to thank you all for your patience. Sometimes the folks that need the most help are the least likely to ask for it. And sometimes the towns that have the most um, beautiful environments are, are um, reluctant to ask for help don't have an easy time thanking outside agencies and folks for their assistance. So on behalf of Hadley, thank you for your work. We've got an amazingly beautiful town. We don't always do things the most efficient way. We don't always think regionally when we should. So your patience is what makes all this happen. It's very easy to walk away from towns that don't appear to want to do business with outside agencies. Uh, to my left is Gordon Smith. He's a farmer. He's a conservation commission member, a historical society member. There's plenty of people who are paying attention that might not be sentimental about what's around them, but are. So just keep up the fight, and when the uh, town's tough to deal with, just keep going. You're sure to find people that want to work with you.